appreciate that. And hey, one, of our, one of our panelists were, uh, was voted off of the island, so uh, <laughs> we're down to four. Uh, actually, we've grown to four. Uh, we've got a couple of new, new panelists you can see there in your program. I'm going to have them introduce themselves and tell a little, little bit about their, uh, their company, the scope uh, of their work, and, and what, what they hope to add to our, our panel today. So why don't we start with... Let's start with Sean, Sean Murphy. Sean? Good morning, everyone. I am Sean Murphy. I'm the Vice President of Fuels and Emissions for Genon Energy. Uh, Genon is the second largest merchant generator in the United States. We own about a little over 25,000 megawatts, including 15 coal facilities. I'm also uh, speaking this afternoon, and uh, sort of the theme of my presentation is we have been, uh, we are a merchant, meaning we have no rate base. We operate strictly at the mercy of the market. And um, we have been facing decisions about many of our uncontrolled coal units. I'm going to go through that this afternoon. Uh, and I'll preview it by saying times are tough for coal generators, particularly in a merchant market. If you don't have controls on your coal units, you're probably going to have a hard time justifying the investment today, which I know is the wrong thing to say to a room full of uh, controlled vendors. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, that is the reality we're facing, and uh, that's my sort of how I'm coming at this and what I hope to contribute. Thank, Thank you, Sean. You. And Steve uh, Whitworth. Steve? Good morning. I'm Steve Whitworth. I'm manager of environmental services with Ameren, which is uh, based in St. Louis. We have operations in both Illinois and Missouri. And, uh, you know, one interesting perspective I think that uh, we have is we have both a rate-regulated and a non-rate-regulated or merchant-generating business. So in my role as environmental manager, uh, I get a question, you know, it's about <coughs> compliance, and a lot of times it's about not only what do we have to do, but why do we have to do it, and when are we going to have to do it, and how, you know, it's a little bit of the crystal ball piece. So I uh, spend a lot of time both communicating to our plants and uh, you know, the people that are getting the work done as well as to upper management as far as what we should be looking at and uh, what are some of the things we can do to evoke some flexibility as well as uh, hedging, if you will, for, you know, all of this uncertainty that we have to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you very much. We had a couple of folks come by and, uh, and put their questions in writing, so I'm going to start with those questions. Uh, Mike, the first question was to you and re regarding something that you mentioned in your presentation. The question was, do you think that uh, the administration, uh, the Obama administration, will uh, ex extend the compliance dates uh, from 24 months to 36 or 48? Uh, your, best, your best guess on what's going to happen, and we know this is a guess. So I was uh, quite encouraged, uh, quite depressed by the results. We'll leave that beside the point. Uh, quite encouraged by the comments that the uh, White House has made that they uh, are eager to find an answer if they can to many of the issues that are in front of us. Uh, <clears throat> I think the uh, President's comments about uh, reaching across the aisle and working with Leader Boehner and, uh, and the Senate Majority Leader uh, is a good move. Uh, I think they're ready to find compromise. Yet this morning I read that uh, instead of 800 million of revenue, uh, the president's goal is 1.6 billion, and and to that, uh, uh, Leader Boehner said, uh, Speaker Boehner said, well, that's fine. If he's looking at 1.6 trillion, I'm sorry, uh, I'm looking for nothing. So that's a little discouraging. On the environmental side, <laughs> where I do want to be a bit more optimistic, we really have had some very meaningful conversations uh, with the administrator. And whether she stays in that role or doesn't, there's all kinds of rumors in Washington that she may step down. That's immaterial, I think, to the way that it unfolds. At the end of the day, reality is going to play. So if they give us a 24-month window to comply and, and we're all 20-odd months into the game and it's clear we're not going to be totally in compliance and the choice will be shut them down or finish what you're doing, we're going to finish what we're doing. So I think reality at the end of the day uh, will come to pass. The president, uh, you know, the whole theory is set up that you, you can get a year uh, and they set it up so that if the RTO felt that there was some reason to extend the timeline, you could get 12 months. So uh, we'll find a way to, to finish it. But 
it is true that any individual 36 month project cannot get done in 24 months, that's just true. And if we're all trying to do them at the same time, that's true in spades. Mike, do you happen to have, and, I, and I'm not thinking that you have this off the top of your head, but do you happen to have the breakdown on how many of these uh, uncontrolled coal units are in red states versus blue states? <laughs> Map, the map switched on me this time, Mr. Chairman, but <laughs> let me, t you know, I mean, I, obviously, uh, we all have some uncontrolled plants. There are plants that came online in the uh, 50s and 60s. They're small megawatts, 200, 300 megawatts. Uh, again, in 1950, we were building super critical. Uh, most people were building critical plants. Their heat rates are huge, uh, so their price points are high. Uh, and they've been running off of uh, uh, Sox and Knox credits over the years. But, th but they're spread across the country. They're dominant throughout that Midwestern region, you know, what I consider to be coal country. I think you know better than me, although there's a lot of coal down here. I always think of the southeast quadrant as being more nuclear, uh, other than Illinois and, you know, the Exelon fleet being more nuclear than others. The far west uh, is a lot of water and uh, a lot of gas. Uh, the east coast used to be a lot of oil not much coal up there, not much coal at all. So the blue states in the northeast quadrant, pretty much coal's off the board. Those that are still up there are being shut down because many of them are merchant plants to the point that Sean made, and those are very different decisions. Let me just uh, speak from a political standpoint because that's how I live my life as an elected official. Uh, I was talking the other day to a, a high-ranking NARUC officer about interim storage of nuclear waste versus permanent storage. And the importance from NARUC's perspective of keeping these linked together uh, and not allowing states to move their, their nuclear material to an interim storage site in another state without having a permanent solution. Uh, and what this NARUC official was reminding me uh, incorrectly is that that if you move that nuclear waste out of that state, you lose the lobbying power of that U.S. senator who has the waste in their state. So, and that U.S. senator is a very important part of this, you know, political puzzle. And I would say probably it's going to be true with the plant upgrades as well here. That if, and that's why I was asking about how many of them were in blue states versus red states because of clout that Democrat senators might have with with the administration. So certainly uh, I think if lots of states are in trouble in terms of not being able to meet the deadline, we're really going to lean heavy on our U.S. congressmen and our, and our senators, do you think? And as you, as you rightfully point out, the senators will have a lot to do with it because I think the House is where it is. They're, they're going to be very stuck on uh, their view of this. But uh, Jim Rogers had a map years ago and I followed Jim for too many years. The first time I ran into Jim, he was assistant general counsel at FERC, and I out traded him in Ray Cates. He's been mad at me ever since. But <laughs> at any rate, <laughs> he had this map that is a pretty telling map. Thirteen uh, states are uh, coal dependent that have Democratic senators. So that back then, that was 26 senators. Maybe one or two of them have retired and moved on. But uh, there's a lot of Democratic senators who will be saying, stretch it out, let's make it realistic. <laughs> This question was asked to me the other day, and I wanted to, to pose it to the panel, uh, and it had to do with a meeting that I'd set up the first day of the legislature last year for Georgia state senators and Georgia uh, representatives to come to about, uh, th this was a presentation that GE did regarding uh, one of their, uh, their um, coal, uh, no, I'm sorry, one of their gas, solar, projects, uh, and it, w w what we were talking about at the time, panel, was, uh, was possibly taking some of the sites that Georgia Power has, where the transmission lines are already there, the interconnection feature is already there, and putting large solar arrays on that existing footprint where that land's already paid for, so you're not really building it up from, from a greenfield. And so this, one of the people in this meeting came to me just last week and said, Tim, do you think if we did 
if, if we use some of the GE technology and we did add solar, would that, and here's the question, would adding renewable capacity to an existing coal plant site have any kind of diluting effect on the mandated pollution upgrades? In other words, if you put five megs of solar or 10 meg or 50 meg of solar on a very large footprint, would that change, would that change what you might have to do in terms of pollution controls uh, on the plant? Anyone? Yeah, uh, we've been working on the idea of solar augmented steam cycles for a while, where we looked actually to put some demos together with a couple of different organizations and we did some plant specific studies. Just to point out the obvious, Sun shines more in certain areas of the country. The southwest is a literally a hot spot, and it's also a fewer clouds. If you go to places like uh, uh, around uh, Columbus or Akron or places like that, it's cloudy a bit up there. Uh, you go to different places in the southeast, and you have not only uh, clouds, but things like uh, haze and water vapor that takes out some of the uh, potential solar. But generally, you can marry it up. In fact, in Australia, they're looking at a demo of uh, this, and we've, we've looked at uh, the, the possibilities. It probably won't be enough to really offset the kind of things you need for emission control. And how do you count it? Hmm, let's see. If I did have solar tax credits, how do I count it hmm. uh, when you have a, a mix of these? It's, again, some of the policy issues and financial issues for very high cost uh, can get in the way. Now the good news about solar is when the sun does shine, often is during the time when it's peak load, at least in the summertime. Uh, that, that's the good news. So there are some places where we've looked at this. We've looked at it with Tri-State uh, in the west. Uh, we've looked at it with Southern a little bit in, the, in another installation in the southeast. So we've looked at some of the regionality of it. <coughs> and it might make sense, but finance is usually the thing that trumps it. It's hard to put together a financial package that makes any sense. Okay. All right. And, and we learned uh, from one of our speakers earlier, you can repeat it back with me, policy trumps finance, trumps technology, right? right. Uh, that was one of our earlier speakers. Sean, were you going to jump in on this? Uh, yes. I, had, I was formerly head of our renewables effort, and I think uh, while the question is a good one, what people forget about solar is uh, the scale of it as compared to fossil fired facilities is just, there's no comparison. Um, and the, the statistics change with the efficiency of solar panels, but, but when I was doing it, it was roughly, uh, you'd have to pave roughly about seven acres of land with a solar array to make one megawatt of power. Uh, we've got a, you know, our plants are 1,000 megawatt, 1,200 megawatt uh, coal-fired power plants. If you want to replace that with solar, you would have to pave the entire state with solar panels. It's just not, the scales are not comparable uh, solar to coal. So could you, could you augment it? In my opinion, this might be the wrong thing to say to the Public Service Commissioner, but it would probably be more for show than it would be for any kind of meaningful uh, contribution. Are you saying that politicians <laughs> do things for show? <laughs> I, resemble, I mean, I resent that. Good thing you've got, mer good thing uh, you've got merchant plans, Sean. <laughs> You know, Mr. Commissioner, one thing that, uh, one of the enabling things, if that were ever to come to pass, and I yeah. don't disagree with either Sean or Stuart's answer, you'd have to have what they did in the Clean Air Act where you'd allow a manufacturer to put a bubble over the plant site, and so the plant site emissions would be affected by the renewables or the non-polluting, and you average that into the bubble of the emissions from that plant. But short of that, it makes no difference. Your coal plant's still your coal plant, and uh, the Sierra Club uh, is pretty straightforward on what they think about coal. So the bubble that you mentioned. That concept so you, might you, work. So if you take Plant Branch, where we closed the oldest two coal units, we now have just two units left there. It's 2,300 acres. Mm -hmm. Georgia Power, they already, they already own it. It's been in rate base. It's been there for a long time. So with 2,300 acres, which basically has nothing but pine trees on it right now, you know, and a couple of coal ash ponds, you know, one of which is now pine trees. Uh, maybe, maybe we could do something like that, especially in a depressed area of the state. So anyway, good answers from the panel. Let's go to the next question. 
Regarding uh, the importance of natural gas, this questioner asked, what's the impact of, of gas transmission and the hurdles uh, uh, to develop, uh, or, excuse me, what's the impact of gas tra transmission and hurdles for development for power generation? He's, he's looking for answers about cost, about timing, other hurdles. Is there, uh, let me just give you an example. In Atlanta here, we have just completed, Georgia Power has just completed uh, the conversion of plant Magdana from coal to natural gas. So that last unit came online, I think, uh, two weeks ago or a week ago. Um, and I, I believe that they had to run that gas 18 miles, I believe, uh, to, and that was a, obviously a, a big part of the cost, run that, that pipeline 18 miles. So uh, to anyone on the panel, what's the impact of gas transportation for power generation? I'll, I'll take a uh, first shot. We do not, we are the electric power research institute, but we have to look at fuels and fuels transport and have a look uh, to some extent at gas storage, pipeline capacity, and limitations around the country. But it usually boils down to something like you just said, the local issue of uh, does someone have a trunk line that can supply it in the first place, and then how do I get that to the plant? Now, in some cases, there are smaller gas lines that are used for things like igniters. Uh, or in other cases, people might bid at bringing you the gas if they want to have a long-term uh, contract with you. And what we've heard anecdotally is a fair amount of that, but we've also seen development of regional storage hubs that have been put for underground storage of gas. There are some of those. Uh, we have seen some build out of, uh, of gas lines, there, and there has been some development of that. And the fact that a gas line is below ground and a, and a uh, power line is above ground, typically, uh, has siting limitations, adds additional siting limitations trying to build out the transmission of electricity rather than transmission of gas. But uh, we see the transmission as mostly secondary to questions on long-term price and supply. And people are bidding now to try and bring gas into new s sites where they didn't have gas before. Uh, becomes a question of what do you want to do with that? Do you want to spend the couple thousand bucks to put in a natural gas gas cycle? Do you want to convert an existing coal plant to use gas in some way? And that has some problems as well. But that's a couple comments. So uh, the first 12 years of my career at American Natural Resources, one of the large uh, interstate gas pipelines, uh, you wouldn't know it today. It first got bought out by El Paso, which got bought out by Kinder Morgan, and so it's changed. And Milwaukee Pipes are still there. They still transport gas under high pressure from the Gulf and the Anadarko Basin. Uh, gas transmission and uh, gas distribution is de minimis uh, when you look at the overall cost of the undertaking. About gas is priced at the Henry Hub for the most part, uh, just like West Texas Intermediate. You add a dollar, you can get anywhere in the country almost. So $3 gas shows up at 4 bucks. That last bit, every gas distribution company uh, in the country wants to build that last bit to uh, charge you a fee to move it that last bit. That's a regulated entity. FERC always tells a story that uh, in the decade of the uh, 2000s, 11,000 miles of gas pipelines were built in this country and about uh, 190 miles of high voltage transmission were built. So gas pipelines, because they're underground, even though it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, if you go across some important person's property, they're pretty easy to do. Any other panelists want to comment? I would just mention from a kind of a permitting perspective that there are challenges to permitting any linear project so that if the infrastructure isn't there, then I think from a time perspective, there's some difficulty with actually getting the pipeline, especially from a major perspective there. And the other thing we think about is we have some existing capacity and you look at, you know, heat rates on the unit, you look at NOx controls and some other things. So it's not necessarily a slam dunk or an automatic. There's some other considerations as well as the flexibility, do you want to maintain that fuel in the future? Do you want flexibility to go back to coal? You need to be able to hedge with your supply and some of the future, uh, you know, things coming down the pike. Is gas going to be, you know, three or four dollars or is it going to be a ton? Do I still want this plant to run 10 years down the road and how do I deal with that? I can just add one real world example. Uh, Genon owned a plant uh, 
still owns the site in uh, New York State on the Hudson River, about 30 miles outside of uh, New York City, so a very high demand area. It was a coal plant, um, and it was uh, sort of death by a thousand New York regulations, so we shut it, we demolished it about two years ago. Uh, so now it's a brownfield site, and the, the state and others, and, and uh, us as business people, have looked at redeveloping the site. The site does have gas access, but as Stewart said, it's not of sufficient capacity to build a big combined cycle plant. You can get some gas there, but the, the, the capacity is not large enough. So when we look at redeveloping it, a large portion of the cost would be to, to upgrade the pipeline to the uh, to the larger capacity to get us the gas we need to build a big facility. It hasn't been, there have been other obstacles to getting that done, but that certainly has not been an insignificant one. Next question, one of the speakers mentioned about uh, one of the shale deposits not yielding what it was initially thought it was gonna yield. So uh, here's the question, is there lessons to be learned from what happened in Great Britain with their North Sea gas supply, which they thought, I guess, was going to last forever, uh, but but now that's not the case. Is there is there lessons to be learned about uh, about our dependence on natural gas for for power production from what's happened in Great Britain, or not so much? I don't know why I'm going first every time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take a shot and. Uh, we have worked with uh, E.ON and other organizations in uh, Great Britain. If you look at the dash to gas that happened a number of years ago, we were working with them at the time on putting scrubbers on for SO2 on coal plants. And a lot of the uh, uh, cycling early work that was done on coal plants that we had access to came from Great Britain because they had to cycle back. So an early lesson learned was what you do to uh, gain flexibility. I think that's one of the things we're learning today as we hit uh, the influx of gas in the U.S. Now, what we're seeing is backing off on that same gas and getting expensive. You saw the chart that I had for LNG price. Well, they get it now from where? Not, not just the North Sea, they get it from Russia. And Russia tends not to want to sell it too cheap. Uh, and so what we're seeing is a, uh, a back off and a balance point and the market is balancing uh, gas. You know, again, you need flexibility, you need options. And, and they're trying to figure out how they can maintain that coal unit in there. At the same time, they're building new gas plants. At the same time, they're under EU directives to come down on their CO2. And I think uh, <coughs> last week it was, uh, or no, this week actually, the EU price per ton of carbon on the uh, EU exchange hit nine euros per ton again. It had been below that, quite low. And that has actually limited the ability to do the things like the big minimum. That's where they were gonna get the money. 300 million tons times whatever price is, that's gonna pay for all these demos. Well, fewer and fewer and fewer are gonna get paid for. So I guess several lessons. One is you need flexibility, you need options. And the third one is Somehow you need to figure out patient money, and that's very hard to come by. Mm. Anyone else? So Mike? The, the North Sea was a conventional gas mine, and so it was, and it was in the phraseology of the drillers, it was an elephant. I mean, it was huge, uh, but it always had a playout cycle, uh, and it was depleted over a period of time. To the Norwegians' credit, they took much of that uh, revenue stream and put it in a, a group called Norges Bank, which invests around the world to husband that uh, well-being for future generations. <clears throat> what we have in shale gas, and, and Ken mentioned it, uh, with the Mississippian now, of course they keep finding this stuff in the wrong state, they find the Mississippian in Illinois and other states, it always confuses those of us who don't have our geography square. Shale play is massive, it's, it is so extensive, and the technology is getting better and better and better, so downhole, through, they go through the shale uh, bed itself, uh, you know, distances as much as a mile, and they never once leave the shale bed. And then the fracking technology is better and will continue to get better. So it is just everywhere. And in our country, because there's a very clear understanding of subsurface ownership rights, if you own the uh, surface rights, you own the subsurface rights. The problem in 
The rest of the world is that's not true and that's not clear. So I don't think you're going to see the same play out. Uh, there was some early on in shale, it was how much does it cost and how long lived are the assets? And those answers uh, are coming in. You can, you can clearly drill it in a $2 market because people continue to do that. Probably they'd be more comfortable if you, if you listen to Aubrey McClendon, it ought to be 8 bucks. You listen to Rex Tillerson, it ought to be $4. So it's just so massive of a footprint that I don't think we'll see that uh, result. Okay, next question. <coughs> and it kind of, kind of goes along with this. If, if states can keep their coal, like Georgia, we've got a lot of coal. So if we're able to keep most of this coal and get our plants, get our plant scrubbed and, and get this done, you know, in, in a timely fashion. What do you think the long-term forecast is for coal if, if, we, keep these, if, the, if we keep these coal yields? I, I can uh, take, take a crack at that one. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about coal, most of it political, about what this administration has done to coal miners and not uh, approving permits and various things they've done. One thing that unequivocally has happened over the last few years is the administration has succeeded in raising the cost to mine coal um, through various regulations. The uh, and we're big, not compared to AP, but we buy about 10 million tons of coal a year. And what we've seen is when when the market was low and producers would sell down to their cost, that number used to be a lot lower than it is today. Today, uh, coal producers are competing with gas, and it's you know, the, the, there's, there's an oversupply in the coal market, so those same producers will say, look, I'll sell it down to my cash cost, and in many cases, that's 20, 30, 40 percent above where it was even five or six years ago. So that has been very surprising to us that y you, you can't get the deals on particularly eastern coal that you once did, and the reason for that is that the cost basis for production has gone up dramatically. So as it relates to states like Georgia, we'll look, you know, I don't think coal's going anywhere. The capacity's probably not going anywhere, but the cost to operate the facilities has gone up, and I think permanently gone up. Anyone else, Mike? Okay, you're going to uh, Just uh, one thing you may have noticed on the slides. What we did was change our range of coal prices and gas prices on a projection. Now, this is just projection, and it's a range, but we uh, changed our uh, last year's or 2011 range from four to eight on uh, gas for 2015 to uh, two to six, dropped it down. And what we did on coal is exactly as you said, we raised it up. Now this is not any real coal, it's an average price which gives PRB and everything in there. But it's uh, 1.8 to two from the last one to two to three. And it's exactly as you're saying, some of the mining regs and other issues that have come in on uh, coal, particularly central app coal, uh, have have made uh, the price go up. And you can see that track on the FERC website that has public data uh, for several of the different uh, fuels. Uh, it, it's pretty dramatic. And these and forecasts, I don't want to un underestimate the importance of these forecasts to commissioners like myself who are sitting on that bench hearing testimony from experts and trying to work with our power company to make a decision about our capacity 20 years out. And so uh, we can't base our decision, you know, on, on our personal opinion. We're really basing it on, on the testimony. And if, if the forecast in, in Georgia Power, when they present to us, I mean, there has been dispute about which forecast to use. Uh, and interveners have argued, well, you're using the wrong forecast because gas should be cheaper and you're using this. and and so as, as commissioners, we hear this, and we have to make a decision, and that forecast may be the, the thing that, that causes us to, to, to close a coal plant and move, move over to natural gas based on the forecast. So it's, it's critical for us to get, uh, you know, to get accurate information about the future because we're trying to make our best guess. Mike? So I just wanted to make sure that, uh, and, and first, I, I'm, I'm so happy to hear you say the things you just said, Mr. Chairman, because the fact of the matter is that is the regulatory compact uh, that has allowed America to be the manufacturing uh, hotbed of the world since uh, the war 
and it will continue to be that way. We've always lived on uh, cost-effective energy, and we have that in front of us today, probably more so than we've ever had it in our, in our most recent history, surely in my career. But those are difficult decisions, and I appreciate you sharing some of the wrestling, that intellectual wrestling you go through when you do that. Coal is being burned worldwide at a huge uptick. So anyone who thinks the American coal miner is going out of business is crazy. And, and so eventually Peabody is the world's biggest uh, producer. They do a lot of stuff out of Indonesia and out of Australia. Uh, the United Kingdom, as I mentioned earlier, in China is building a coal plant. Uh, you know, every 12, 14 days, 1,000 megawatt comes on, they have to. Uh, they're good plants, they're not yesterday's technologies. They're, they're critical, super critical plants. Uh, Germany, is, Germany added uh, 7,000 megawatts of coal just last year and this year combined. So coal is going up. The European Union uh, carbon footprint uh, it went up by 4% last year if you look at consumed energy. Not the emissions in the EU, but consumed energy because they're buying electricity from Poland and other uh, countries that are selling into the marketplace. So coal use is going up worldwide. You'll see some of the smaller U.S. coal guys be get bought out by the Glencores, Nick Stratas, and others because there's a massive worldwide demand for coal. China has coal, they'll burn it. India has coal, they'll burn it. Russia has coal, they'll burn it. We have coal, we'll burn it. we got time for one more, one more question for the panel. Will electric cars have a negative impact on the grid or on capacity? Well, it, it depends on when you charge them. You know, I think that's pretty straightforward. It, it's, a, it's a perfect answer if we all charge them at night uh, in our garage. And we as an industry, we, we can make things more complicated than you can imagine. So <laughs> if, if you came to me and said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Pulte Homes or pick a, uh, pick a home developer, and you say, I'm going to build a 500-unit uh, subdivision in this cornfield. You know, of course, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty impractical in today's housing market, but let's just play a game. I'd be the happiest person in the world. 500 homes? Uh, let's do what we got to do. We'll string out a new line. We'll put in a substation. We'll do whatever we got to do. If you came to me and said, uh, at the airport, I'm going to build a 1,000-car uh, garage uh, with electrical outlets so that when people go flying around the country, they can plug their cars in. I'd be happy, but we as an industry keep saying, oh, this is going to make the grid. Oh, my goodness, how are we going to do this? We'll do it. It's, uh, it's one of the growth opportunities we see. It, we, we would welcome it anywhere that we could. I want to build the infrastructure before GE does. Th <laughs> thank you. Very quickly. Uh, yes, very quickly. Oh, uh, just a point that a few years ago we put out a uh, combined report with the Natural Resources Defense Council on the impact of uh, different types of generation mixes with the electric uh, vehicle use. And uh, the bottom line was simple. No matter if it's a coal-heavy uh, utility or a gas-heavy, nuclear-heavy utility, uh, there's a benefit from uh, electric uh, vehicle electrification on overall CO2. Mm -hmm. That's a public report uh, jointly sponsored by NRDC and ourselves. And uh, I'll say that uh, as a bunch of early adopters working for the Electric Power Research Institute, there aren't enough charging stations in our parking lot right now. There are more <coughs> plug-in vehicles than there are spots to plug them in. Which is probably good because they charge during the day. Panel, panel, thank you very much. Let me just uh, say this in closing before I introduce our, our next speaker and dismiss our panel. Uh, and by the way, I'm going I'm going to have to leave you this afternoon. My wife has sold my house, <laughs> um, and she has a house for me to look at at 3:30. My house will close on December 28th, and I'm leaving for Washington tomorrow morning. Uh, so I must go and see this house that my wife wants to purchase this afternoon so I can make an offer on it tonight so we can fit the closing date in by the end of the year because I have seven children, by the way, uh, and, and they'll all be home for Christmas, and they actually wow. want to go to the Chick-fil-A game on December 31st. So I've, got, I've got quite a bit now that's... Uh, so that, you that thought that picking a coal plant or a gas plant was tough. Yeah, really. <laughs> Let, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Um, I, I have a natural gas car that runs on, on methane. It's a Honda. And I've been a big proponent of alternative fuel. 
and I and I have range anxiety on a regular basis as I drive <laughs> this natural gas car. But let me say this about Georgia Power and why I believe that in Atlanta you're going to see the electric car market surge far faster than the natural gas car market has ever thought about surging is because Georgia Power very quickly responded and created a time of use rate, a super off peak rate for car charging overnight, allowing folks who are on that time of use rate to charge in that super off peak period for just over a penny, a penny, and that's their whole house operation in that super off peak period. So mm. when you have when you have the utility responding like this, it is going to help this industry uh, take off because it, it allows people to see uh, some financial benefit. And uh, I regulate, uh, the commission regulates uh, Atlanta Gas Light, who owns our gas pipeline under, under the ground, most of our pipes in our state. And the natural gas industry, and I told this to the, to the president of, of AGL, uh, in trying to get them to get their employees to drive natural gas cars. I said to him, look, I'm driving one of these things, and it's inconvenient for me. If natural gas vehicles don't work for you and your company, it doesn't work for anybody. So I'd like to see you guys, I'd like to see the executives of your company driving these cars. I'd like to see, I'd like to see a, a demo on your floor in your building so that your employees can see these. I'd like to see you give an incentive to your employees to drive a natural gas car, but gas companies are not doing this. Therefore, natural gas cars, and I have one, natural gas cars will not take off like electric cars will. So kudos to Georgia Power. Let me just say this in conclusion about Georgia Power, that this company is is an excellent company. It is, and I'll regulate them. I don't even take a drink of water from them. When I go to their office, I carry my own bottle of water, okay? I don't, I don't take anything from them, but I'm going to say that their level, their level of expertise, excellence, commitment to safety, uh, and customer service is one of the reasons that, that Georgia, despite not having a uranium mine, not having a natural gas well, not having a single coal mine is one of the cheapest states in the United States for electricity. And so I believe if, if we had had a Hurricane Sandy uh, in Georgia, you wouldn't see the problems on the grid that you see in New York because we have a company, we have a company that really thinks ahead and plans and is excellent. So the Southern Company employees and Georgia Power people here, thumbs up to you for a great job. It's a pleasure working with you. Panel, thank you very much for being here. Our next speaker is uh, Bruce Kaiser was slated to be here and could not make it. John Meyer is going to be taking his place uh, as uh, the Global Mercury Line product manager uh, in the next presentation. He's in control of Mercury Control Technologies, new product R&D, customer trials, analytics. He's been seven years uh, with Nalco, uh, has a BS in engineering from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, John, thanks for coming and filling in today. Good afternoon. Um, fortunately, Bruce couldn't be here today. Personal matter he had to attend to. Again, my name is John Meyer. I'm the global product line manager for Nalco's Mercury Control offering. Uh, you know, on the flight in today or last night, I was kind of thinking about do I have to click on it? I was thinking about, you know, where we are today on Mercury Control and where we were 10 years ago with the Might be a short presentation here. Can you? <laughs> 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 so.
so couldn't help thinking about where we are today with mercury control and where we were 10 years ago when the clean air mercury rule came out. And I think one of the, the major differences is we have a lot more options. Uh, back in the early 2000s, I think a lot of utilities, uh, the de facto standard was activated carbon injection. Um, there was a little bit of work on fuel additives, but I think most plants planned on installing activated carbon injection. And uh, today, I think we have a better understanding of what are the fundamentals of mercury control, what are things that can limit our mercury control, uh, and how we can reduce compliance costs. And that's gonna be the focus of the presentation today. As such, a lot of the utilities today are, are looking at their options. They're spending a lot of time doing baseline measurements, seeing, okay, what is limiting my mercury capture? We know mercury oxidation plays a huge role. Uh, elemental mercury is very difficult to deal with in comparison to oxidized mercury. So th these are just some of the ways that we can reduce compliance costs uh, compared to just the standard activated carbon injection. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the key benefits to looking at these alternative technologies is it can offset uh, capital expenditures. I know a lot of the utilities when MATS first came out thought they would have to install fabric filters uh, because they would have to inject large amounts of carbon, tripping particulate limits, and causing other issues. Well, by doing a little bit more work on the front end, uh, they found that using some of these alternative technologies like fuel additives, re-emission suppressants, uh, they can completely eliminate that, you know, potentially $50 million expenditure. As such, with all this, this work going on in demonstrations, baseline examinations, um, uh, NALCO and a lot of the other service providers in the industry have been inundated with demonstrations, trials, data collection. Uh, there's, at the bottom, in 20, 2010, we did about five mercury demonstrations. There weren't a lot of drivers. It was all uh, state regulations. 2011, modest increase. This year, that number has us at, uh, you know, 35 to 40. I think that's closer to 50 now. Uh, they're coming in as fast as we can take them. One of the, the major hurdles when planning these is a lot of the test teams are booked out for three, four months in advance. And, you know, that's another thing I think we've learned since the camera days is the measurements are extremely critical. Uh, mercury can be very difficult to measure, and if you don't have accurate measurements, you can be making uh, poor decisions based off of that. So. so general outline, uh, some of the ways that you can reduce compliance costs, uh, you know, affecting mercury speciation, there's quite a few suppliers of fuel additives. Um, where you can increase the oxidized fraction of mercury in the flue gas, making it more readily capturable by activated carbon, or any acid gas scrubbing you may have downstream. We also, I think, have a better understanding of a phenomenon, mercury re-emission across a wet FGD. Uh, personally, I had heard about mercury re-emission years past, but never experienced it firsthand until probably two or three years ago. And I think that was, part of the reason was people weren't measuring inlet outlet to a wet FGD. Uh, they they kind of assumed if I'm burning a, a Eastern fuel, high chlorine, I just should just have high, high capture rates across the wet FGD, excess 80%, 90%. And what we're finding today is a lot of plants are only getting 50% in some cases, and that's due to mercury re-emission. As we increase mercury capture rates, we're gonna have to deal with the byproducts associated with that, whether it's fly ash, whether you're forcing more mercury into the wet FGD. I'll briefly cover that. And then also we've got a novel product uh, that we're just now commercializing, introducing to the market. Um, it's 
It's a, a product specifically for SDAs. It's a liquid application. All, actually, all the products I'm going to talk about are liquid applications today. Advantages, very low capital. You're talking about tanks and pumps, essentially, uh, with some minor controls included. So to give you an idea of where each of the products are applied, uh, 7895 is the fuel additive to increase mercury oxidation. It's either applied on the coal belt as the coal enters the bunker. It also can be applied at the coal feeders. Uh, it's really plant specific, what they'd prefer. The scrubber additive is 6012. Uh, Merc control 8034 is the mercury reemission additive for suppressant. Uh, we've injected that directly into the basin, also into recirculation lines, so there are some options with that. And then I'll briefly touch on Nailmet 1689. Again, as we force more mercury into the wet FGD, uh, some of the plants are going to have to be concerned with meeting discharge limits on mercury as well. So the first case study focuses on Merc Control 7895. Uh, again, that's the fuel additive. It's stable, water-based. Uh, again, can either go at the, the coal belt going into the bunkers or at the coal feeder. Uh, the result is, you know, uh, traditionally this technology was thought to be useful for uh, Western fuels that are low in chlorine, you know, where they may have a baseline mercury oxidation rate of 30%, 40%. By adding a product like 7895, you can increase that up to 80% uh, oxidizing the fuel gas. And also, it can be used in, in conjunction with activated carbon. Uh, one of the plants that were, one configuration that was having a lot of difficulty back in the CAMR days was exactly this configuration of our first case study. Uh, the units that didn't have acid gas scrubbing on the back end. They just have a cold side ESP. They're burning Western fuels. Uh, ten years ago, it was a big problem if they wanted to still sell their fly ash. And what we're finding today is by using a product, a fuel additive like 7895, you can decrease the carbon injection rate to where the fly ash is still usable for concrete manufacturing. Uh, at the top, you see the site description. It's a 600 megawatt unit, low chlorine fuel, cold side ESP. They've got some, some NOx control, uh, no SCR. Uh, there were two goals of the demonstration. One was to achieve 90% mercury capture. The other was to minimize the activated carbon rate uh, to permit fly ash reuse in concrete. The, the client had just closed that as long as we can maintain the ACI rate below two pounds per million ACF, they felt like it would still be adequate to be used in concrete manufacture. So we'll usually look at two injection locations for these demonstrations, uh, before and after the air heater. There's advantages or, and disadvantages to both, if, um, depending on your coal type and your configuration. So if we look at the yellow squares, that's just a standard halogenated uh, pack. So that's like Darko HGLH, Calgon's um, MC Plus, ADA's Power Pack. Uh, what we found with activated carbon after the air heater, it took about four and a half pounds per million ACF to reach the 90% mercury capture. All these dots over to the left are uh, just standard non-brominated packs. Uh, they each have varying qualities. Uh, some are finer grind. Some um, are a little bit lower quality. Uh, they're all at different price points. That's why we wanted to look at them. But by adding the 7895, we can decrease the injection rate of the carbon below the two pounds per million ACF. So at that point, it's an acceptable solution to the plant. Now our, our flow rates are fairly high on the 7895. These PPM weight are milligram solution 7895 over kilogram coal. So uh, if you look at the blue diamonds, we're at a 422 PPM injection rate. That's a little higher than we'd like to be. We moved the ACI injection to pre-air heater. Again, we tried the standard halogenated carbon. You, you can see that it took a little over two and a half pounds per million ACF. 
what was substantial was it, it, it again shifted our injection rates of activated carbon, but also reduced our 7895 consumption rates by over 75% uh, and reduced the ACI injection rate to about a half pound per million ACI. Uh, there's very minimal, if any, impact to the fly ash quality, no issues with discoloration. Um, what we're finding with this dual approach is one of the issues with activated carbon and fly ash is the fluctuation of carbon content uh, because it changes the amount of air entrainment agent they need to add. By using a dual approach, you can keep the carbon rate relatively constant and then fluctuate the 7895 rate, which doesn't have any adverse effects on the fly ash. So uh, this data to me was, was interesting because these are injection rates you typically see on a fabric filter. Um, for ESPs, we usually think of it in this two and a half to three. Uh, so again, we have, we have a, a, a fly ash friendly solution where 10 years ago, uh, this would not have been available. So I mentioned earlier that the, the fuel additives are primarily thought to be effective on low chlorine fuels, western fuels. This is an example of a eastern fuel where the chlorine content is 1,200 ppm. Uh, the 7895 is a bromine-based technology. Uh, there's been a lot of work to show that bromine is just more effective at oxidizing mercury compared to chlorine, and we see that in the results of the demonstration. This was the baseline HG capture, and it was about 60%. By adding the fuel additive, at about 265 uh, parts per million weights, we were able to meet their 0 .08, 0 0.008 pound per gigawatt limit. So even with the 1,200 ppm of chlorine, you still see benefit from the fuel additives. So as part of your demonstrations, investigations, don't just assume, well, I have enough chlorine uh, because bromine is still more effective and oxidizing mercury. So as I, I mentioned earlier, we're going to have to force the mercury to either the ESP fabric filter, it has to go somewhere. In this case, that unit had an SCR and a wet FTD. We're increasing the oxidized mercury, which therefore increases the capture rate across the wet FTD. We're forcing more mercury into that wet FTD. They had a, a limitation on their mercury discharge. Uh, they had a permit limit. So we didn't want to increase the concentration of mercury in their wastewater. Nalco, and I think one of the strengths that Nalco has is we have the air side, but we're based on the water side. So we actually have a product, Nalmet 1689, uh, which is a polymeric precipitant used for that exact purpose to remove metals from wastewater streams. You can see on the bottom the selectivity of, of metals, uh, mercury being the highest. The idea with the product is to Im improve flock formation and removal across existing wastewater treatment pro programs. So the, the left side is the clarifier effluent. Uh, what you see is with increasing air mercury capture, again, we're increasing the amount of mercury into the wet FGD. We don't see an increase in the clarifier effluent. So again, where is the mercury going? On the right side, x-axis is air mercury capture. Uh, this is total mercury in the clarifier solids. You can see a pretty strong correlation to the mercury capture and the mercury in the clarifier solids. It's got to go somewhere. Uh, this is the smallest stream that we can contain it in. Uh, doesn't cause any issues with leachability. Uh, so this was what was desirable for this specific plant. Again, it's, it's important to look at what are the goals and what are the constraints on these, right? So with that, I'd like to talk briefly about the mer our MER control 8034. It's a mercury uh, re-emission suppressant. So it's applied to the wet FGD basin or recirculation line. Uh, very simple installation, tanks, metering pumps, very small control system, which I'll show later. So what is mercury re-emission? Uh, 
essentially it's a, re it's a reduction of oxidized or soluble mercury in the basin uh, back to its elemental form. So the simple definition is if you have more elemental mercury coming out of your stack than you had going into the wet FGD, you have mercury re-emission. So one of the lower cost ways to reduce your stack <coughs> is to add this product to the basin. Uh, R8034 product has reduced up to 100% mercury re-emission. Uh, we've, we've had several head-to-head -head competitions. I'll so you show you some independent lab data where we've outper outperformed competitors' products. Uh, we haven't seen any adverse effects to gypsum <coughs> in, in our demonstrations, and it is a patented technology. Uh, this is the mechanism of mercury remission. Please don't ask me to explain it because we'll both probably be disappointed <laughs> in the end. Uh, there, there's quite a few variables, uh, sulfite, sulfate concentration, ORP, pH, oxidation. Mercury remission to me is where activated carbon was 10, 15 years ago. We're, we're beginning to scratch the surface today uh, some may disagree with me, but I, I don't know that there's anyone in the industry that can look at a scrubber on paper and say they are going to have mercury remission. You really need the gas phase data to, to know for sure. This is just some independent results, lab scale. There is a, a source at the bottom, which I'm sure is you're not able to read in the back, but if anyone wants this, we can provide it. It compares the, the Nalco additive at the bottom uh, to TMT in, uh, under a couple different conditions. So what this shows is the, the larger the bar, the more re-emission you have. Uh, with the Nalco additive, we were able to completely, re completely eliminate re-emission. Uh, the other additives, there was one condition, but it required some additional reagents. We're seeing a lot of benefit when we've applied the technology. Uh, it seems to be doing very well across several different configurations. So this is uh, another case study. This is specific to the 8034 product. It's a 500 megawatt unit, uh, about 3% sulfur. Uh, the plant has a cold side ESP, uh, limestone forced oxidation, wet FGD. And what they were seeing was, was very limited mercury capture, and I'll get into that data in a little bit, but with the high chlorine they had, you expected 70, 80%, and I, th I think we were seeing somewhere around 40%. This is an example of a demonstration skid. You can see the tote in the background. We can either do totes or bulk. That's the injection point, not too much to it. Um, that's, that's one of the benefits of it. There's not a lot that can go wrong. Again, low capital for installation. Some of the equations we'll use, uh, if anyone wants, this is just for kind of future use. The demonstration was carried out across several different load conditions. You can see by the, the change in flue gas sulfur, there were quite a few different coal types being burned. Uh, from that, you can see varying oxidation rates. Part of the reason why you see a little bit of scatter in this data. Now, the blue line is mercury capture, the red line is mercury re emission as a percentage. The black line is merc control 8034 relative dosage. So, what you can see is we introduced the product here, we've got about you know, anywhere from 60 to 80 percent mercury re emission. We introduced the product, it can sometimes take a little bit of time. Um, to get re-emissions under control because you're trying to move a large volume, you're trying to move a large volume of chemistry. I think this particular plant was like 700,000 gallons, so it's, it's really a function of the size of the pumps that you have on site. But within a day or so, we're able to uh, have the chemistry take hold. You see the re-emissions are at about 70% and it decreases to below 20% at times uh, near zero. We fluctuated the 8034 rates uh, depending on scrubber chemistry as well as the gas phase measurements. So that's why you'll see some spikes. We increase dosage, the re-emissions get under control. 
for the demonstrations, it's pretty hard to optimize to where it, it holds constant at zero. Um, a lot of times for short demonstrations, we don't have access to plant data where we can we can hook that into our controller. Um, so we're really we're really reacting instead of being proactive with a with what a, a permanent system would do. Now what we can do is install a monitor and a control skid. This has been developed over the last couple years uh, over our experience with the demonstration. Some of the advantages are that it, it automatically controls dosage of 8034. It also mo monitors uh, scrubber chemistry. At the very bottom of the screen, uh, we can ins insert different probes that'll you know, go back to the control system data log. We can retrieve that data depending on what the plant specifically wants to look at. At one of the demonstrations, we included corrosion monitoring. This was a wet FTD with 2205 alloy. The blue line is 8034 uh, dosage. Uh, the green and red are general corrosion and pitting rates. What you can see, and we were frankly happy to see, was with the 8034 addition, the corrosion rates and pitting rates are pretty minimal, uh, almost negligible. After we turned off the dosage at this point, you can see an increase in, in corrosion and pitting. Uh, this is something we're, we're keeping an eye on going forward. Uh, I don't know that we're in a position today to say use 8034 to mitigate corrosion, but if it's of interest to you at your specific site, uh, we are looking for an extended test, an extended test site to, to you know, reinforce what we've seen at this last demonstration. And you can see the, the time frame is about, it was about a 30 day uh, demonstration. We can also look at other alloys. We can cater the program to, to your specific site. So this is a summary of the 8034 performance. During baseline, the mercury oxidation was about 80%. That's important because the scrubber, if only 80% of the mercury is oxidized, you, you can only get 80% capture across the wet FTD. The, the wet FTD is not gonna do anything with elemental mercury. Uh, capture rate, baseline again was about 23%. So they were re-emitting a lot of the mercury entering the wet FGD. Wet FGD efficiency, which is defined as of the oxidized mercury entering the scrubber, how much of that are we catching in the wet FGD? With 8034, uh, oxidation was similar to that of baseline, 80 versus 74%. Re-emission at baseline was 60%. With 8034, it was decreased to about 10% with a standard deviation of 10. Capture rate was increased to 65%. Again, this capture rate, ideal world, this would be 74 and 74. Uh, so it's fairly close to 100% efficient. So we took the wet FGD from 40% to 90% efficient in capturing mercury. This is just another way that you can reduce compliance costs, reduce the effects on your existing equipment, and potentially uh, eliminate the need for a bag house. So what impact did it have on the wet FGD liquor chemistry? This is rel relative soluble mercury. What the 8034 does is it, it binds the soluble mercury in the wet FGD so that it's not available to be re-emitted. Um, the untreated FGD you can see is fairly high. Uh, with the treatment of uh, 8034, you can see the re-emission rate was about 60%. As that decreases, we uh, decrease the relative soluble mercury as well. And that's exactly what we expect to see. <coughs> so the last technology, this is, this is very new, uh, I think, to the industry as well, to NALCO. Uh, it's Merc Control 6012. It's specifically for SDA applications. What we're hearing from the market, what we're seeing is a lot of plants are, are uh, what FGDs are kind of being moved away from. A lot of the newer plants are looking at SD, SDAs. Part of that is because water regulations are only, uh, 
we're expecting water regulations to become more stringent in the future. Um, you know, you've got zero limit discharges in some cases. Uh, with this concern on the water side, SDA has become more attractive. As such, we've, we've developed a product specific to SDAs. It's a liquid application. You can go in with the slurry line or the conditioning uh, water. I, I believe it's fairly unique to the industry as far as being a liquid application. This is some of the recent trial data. So at the bottom, this black line is our 60-12 feed rate. We put it in pounds per million ACF because that's what people are used to seeing in the industry in regards to sorbent. And pretty rapidly after injecting the product, this red line is the stack total mercury. You can see it de decreases pretty dramatically. We increase the feed rate up to about 1.1 pound per million ACF. And the mercury went down to about 0.3 uh, micrograms per dry standard cubic meter. Now, in pounds per trillion, this is a, a Western fuel that's it's pretty much one-to-one. -one, so it's 0.3 pounds per trillion BTU. Uh, with some of the newer plants coming on, I, I've heard you know, mercury capture rates, requirements of excess 90%, 99%. This is an option where, you know, extremely high capture rates are required. Um, we've also tried the product with the 7895 additive. What we saw was we were able to reduce it from previous, uh, you know, about 0.6, 1.1, we could reduce that flow rate down to about 0.27 um, by adding a very small amount. The, the black line is in pounds per million ACF, the green is in gallons per hour. So we're only talking about, uh, about at the highest 7895 injection rate, we're talking about 0.6 gallons per hour, so very minimal injection rate. But we were again able to reduce the stack mercury down to the 0.3 we did compare that to activated carbon injection. Left axis is total HG emissions in micrograms per dry standard. Comparing the products at one pound per million ACF, uh, commercially available brominated pack, uh, the emissions were still at about 3.8. We tried a dry version of our 6012 product that uh, reached an emission level of about 2.3. Using the wet version, uh, again, we saw that about 0.3 microgram per <coughs> cubic meter emission rate. We increased the pack level. We actually didn't try the, the slurry uh, option of 6012 because we were already so low at one pound per million ACF. But at two pounds, um, we were still only at an emission rate of about 2.3, 2.4 with the commercially available, available pack. We are looking for another demonstration site. Uh, we understand that the time frame of the data we just showed you is fairly short. Uh, we need to run it for a longer period of time, make sure there's no balance of plan impacts. But if anyone's interested in that, uh, please come and see us. With that, I can take any questions. I know that was pretty quick. and that concludes this morning's presentations. We will have buffet lunches served for you outside and we'll show you where they are. We have three tables, so please spread yourself around and then we'll, we'll uh, commence again at 1.30. <coughs>